I welcome you all to the launch event of the Zombie Tracker on the Zombie Trail. And I should start by ex explaining what the Zombie Tracker is. So in 2008, the Information Technology Act was amended to add Section 66A. This section penalized the transmission of offensive messages uh, online. However, the provision failed to define what the term offensive constituted. Subsequently, after there were a lot of cases in which the section was used uh, in the landmark judgment of Shreya Singhal versus Union of India, the Supreme Court held this provision to be unconstitutional uh, for being vague and arbitrary. However, the story should have ended there, but it did not. Use of this unconstitutional provision to target online speech continued, and this is why we decided to build this tracker. This tracker aims to map all ongoing cases in which this unconstitutional provision has been instituted. Our ultimate goal is to ensure that the use of this provision, which refuses to die and keeps coming back like a zombie, is stopped all over the country. Now, to begin this event and to truly understand the need for this tracker, we will have a short conversation with Mr. Zakil Ali Tyagi, who is currently facing prosecution under the provision even after the Sriya Singhal decision declared it to be unconstitutional. Namaste, Zakir ji. Ji, namaste. First of all, I would like to welcome you and thank you for coming here today. I would like to ask you two questions. First of all, what did you post that you posted 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 तो वो अपने संसदीय क्षेत्र गोरखपुर में गए और गोरखपुर में एक सभा को संबोधित करते हुए उन्होंने कहा कि गुंडे बदमाश यूपी छोड़कर चले जाएं वरना उनकी दो ही जगह होंगी या तो जेल या वो जगह जहां पर कोई भी नहीं जाना चाहेगा उसी पर मैंने उसी भाषण की आलोचना करते हुए अपने फेसबुक पोस्ट पर लिखा था कि मेरी क्या मजाल योगी जी जो आपको कह सकूं कि आप पर भी 28 मुकदमे दर्ज हैं जिनमें 22 बहुत गंभीर हैं बस उसी की कुछ जर्नलिस्ट लोगों ने मेरे उसी फेसबुक पोस्ट का स्क्रीनशॉट लेकर ट्विटर पर ऑनलाइन रिपोर्ट कर दी और उसकी वजह से मुझको मुजफ्फरनगर गाजियाबाद और मेरठ की पुलिस ने मिलके मुझको 2 अप्रैल 2017 में मेरे घर से मुजफ्फरनगर से गिरफ्तार कर लिया और मुझे कोतवाली में ले जाया जाता है शहर कोतवाली में और वहां पर मैं शुक्रिया अदा करता हूं पुलिस का कि पुलिस ने तो मेरे साथ में मारपीट नहीं की लेकिन पुलिस ने अपने वहां पर कुछ बीजेपी के वर्कर्स बुलाए और उनके उनसे मेरे साथ में मारपीट कराई गई रात भर मुझे कोताली में बिठाए रखा और सुबह मुझको 66 ए 420 और 420 और 66 ए के साथ मुझे जेल में भेज दिया गया मैं जेल में 42 दिनों तक रहा और काफी संघर्ष के बाद जमानत तो मिल गई लेकिन जैसे ही मैं जमानत से रिहा हुआ तो मुझ पर चार सीट में मुजफ्फरनगर पुलिस फिर शेडिसन भी जोड़ देती है और 420 मुझ पर इसलिए लगाया जाता है क्योंकि गाजियाबाद के दादरी में बदमाशों को गिरफ्तार करने के दरोगा अख्तर अली को बदमाश अपनी गोली से मार देते हैं उनको श्रद्धांजलि अर्पित करने के रूप में मैंने उनकी तस्वीर को अपनी प्रोफाइल पिक्चर बनाया था लेकिन पुलिस ने उस पर भी एतराज जताते हुए मुझ पर 420 का केस दर्ज किया और एक अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल सेक्शन 66 ए भी मुझ पर जो है दर्ज किया गया और हालांकि बाद में जब उसकी आलोचनाएं हुई मुजफ्फरनगर पुलिस की और सरकार की मेरे सेक्शन जो मुझ पर जो 66 ए लगाया गया था उसके बाद वो पुलिस ने उसको हटा लिया अब मुझ पर 420 यानी कि 420 और शेडिशन के तहत मुकदमा मुजफ्फरनगर कोर्ट में चल रहा है धन्यवाद जाकिर जी कि आप यहाँ पे आए और आपने हमें बताया कि आपके साथ क्या हुआ है अब आ, मैं आपका धन्यवाद कहना चाहूँगी और आपसे विदा लेना चाहूँगी थैंक यू थैंक यू शुक्रिया नाउ वी विल हैव अ वेबसाइट वॉक थ्रू ऑफ द प्लेटफॉर्म दैट हैज बीन क्रिएटेड टू मैप सेक्शन 66 ए IFF has made this platform with our partners, Civic Data Lab, and now I would like to invite Mr. Abhinav from Civic Data Lab to share the, to do the platform walkthrough. Abhinav? Thank you, Anushka. Yeah, I will just start sharing my screen.
Hi everyone. Uh, Anushka, uh, is my screen live? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so we'll do a quick walk walkthrough of the platform that we have built to track Section 66A of the Information Technology Act. The website or the platform is hosted at zombietracker.in and when we open the website, the home page uh, which we see uh, starts with a discussion or a talk about why are we tracking Section 66A of the Information Technology Act. As we scroll down, uh, we discuss about why is it called the zombie tracker. Just below that, we'll find a video which does a walkthrough of the website and also uh, talks about uh, the illegality of Section 66A. When we scroll below, we'll see a timeline of Section 66A from its conception in 2008 till 2020. Just below the timeline, we will see uh, a list of blogs which uh, our team has written for Section 66A. And we'll be able to see the latest blogs which has been uh, put on our platform. When we go up, the next link which we see is the tracker link. The tracker page constitutes of a map which uh, shows the number of cases, which has been uh, the number of cases uh, across states in India uh, belonging to Section 66A of IT Act. And we also, and, and the default time period for which this, uh, this map is populated with is from 27, 10, 2009 till 15, 2, 2020. We also have an option of customizing the time period for which we want to see the data. The data is currently populated from 11 states, which we have considered for the first phase of our platform. We do have an option of uh, checking out or seeing the number of cases which were instituted prior to the decision of Supreme Court in Shreya Shingal versus Union of India case. And we also have an option of uh, checking the data uh, post uh, the decision of Supreme Court in this case. The first thing which we see is the case registered. It shows the number of cases which has been registered under this section. The second option which uh, gives us the number of cases which are still pending and which has not been disposed or resolved yet. The third option gives us the number of cases which has been disposed so far. And the fourth one is the cases and his judgment has been given out. So as we can see, there are like 236 cases so far in which judgment has been introduced. We also have the option to see this data in the form of a table of view by clicking on the icon on the left hand side. As we scroll down the page, we have a range of graph to showcase different uh, different uh, history and different uh, trends in the section 66A uh, cases of IT Act. So the first set of graph which we see talks about the registration, pendency and disposal of 66A cases. Next to that, we have a graph which shows all the acts and sections which are generally clubbed with section 66A of the IT Act. When we scroll down, we have another set of graph, another graph, which uh, shows us a relation between the internet penetration in a, in a, in a in country level or in a state and the versus the cases that has been registered in that area. When we scroll further below, we see a table which shows the case load year on year. So this whole page which we are seeing is at India level. Now we also have an option of seeing the data at a more detailed view for a particular state. Now see it, I click on the state of Maharashtra. Now the page which will open will show us the data only for the state of Maharashtra. Maharashtra. The structure of the page remains the same as we saw earlier. The only thing is that you now it shows us the graphs and the tables related to the 66 A cases data from Maharashtra state. Next, we have uh, the next uh, link which we have is for methodology. There are three sections inside it. 
the first one talks about the aim why we are building this platform and what is the need of it the second link talks about the methodology of how we have collected the data how we have uh, cleaned the data and how we have built this platform the third section is the challenges it talks about the challenges which we faced while building this platform which ranges from the incompleteness of data to finding very known as standard data from the equals website the next link is about the recommendations which we have. This is also divided into three sections. The first one is recommendations belonging to 66A. That is what is our recommendations related to 66A. The next section in under recommendations is recommendations for e-codes. That is what do we recommend to make the e-code data more useful and more publicly available. And the third section is the general recommendations which we are providing. The next thing is the reporting page. This is the page from where you can get in touch with us if you have any queries or if you have any cases which you want to talk about with us, then this is the page which we can you, you can use to get in touch with us. The next is a uh, glossary. Here also we have two items. The first one is the process page. So the process page talks about, it's, it's actually explains in the form of a flow chart. What is the general process which is followed after uh, the conception of a case or after a case is registered? The another thing inside glossary section is the terms, which talks about the terms which are normally followed in the judicial sector. And uh, we can call it like judicial jargons, which are like followed in uh, the sector. So here we can see uh, a list of terms which has been used across the website, which you will find used across the website. And also when we are doing a study of section 66 a cases, or for that matter, any other judicial cases. The next section, the next section is uh, the blogs. So this is the list of blogs which we have written about uh, six, section 66A of the Information Technology Act. Clicking on any of these cards will uh, take us to the whole uh, blog in detail. The next link is about a space where we can get information about Civic Data Lab, Internet Freedom Foundation, and the team who had been actively involved in the creation of the platform. Here you will also find the social media links of uh, individual team members to whom if you want, you can reach out to. At the bottom of the page, we can find the legal terms and conditions of, utilize, of using this platform. And just below that, we have the supporter space which talks about what are we trying to build? What is the benefit will it have? And why do we need this? And where do we need your help in building this platform more comprehensive and extending it through the whole India, moving ahead from 11 states? So uh, basically, this is a brief walkthrough of the website. Uh, I will end Thanks. the walkthrough here. Thank you, Anushka. You can take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhinav. I would now like to invite my colleague and IFF's amazing litigation counsel, Ms. Devrata Mukhopadhyay, who will be moderating the next part of the event, which is the panel discussion. Dev? Thanks, Anushka. And thank you to everyone who's joining us for this event. We have with us today two lawyers, Abhinav Sekri and Sanjana Srikumar, and one technologist, Apoorv Anand, who's been involved in building of this project to talk a little bit about this legal zombie section 66A. Abhinav, Sanjana and Apoorv have all been involved in tracking and challenging continued misuse of section 66A, but at very different points of time. So what I'll do is I'll start chronologically with Abhinav because I think that's gonna be the easiest to follow. So Abhinav, starting with you, can you tell us a little bit about how you first found out about this problem? And more importantly, how did you go about investigating and trying to quantify the scope of this problem? 
for those of you who you may not know this, uh, this project actually dates back to a paper that Abhinav had co-authored with Apar, who is IFF's executive director, back in October of 2018. So we're going to talk to Abhinav a little bit about what was it like doing research for that paper and writing that paper, which then went on to become the basis for subsequent litigation and more data-driven projects like the Zombie Tracker. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so like many good things, this also began over Chai, where Abhinav had and I had also obviously seen news reports about cases, including Zakir Ji's case, who we just heard from at the start of this conversation. And uh, we sort of met over a cup of chai and the idea was to try and figure out a, you know, 66A as one instance and see, okay, what is happening with other crimes as well. And uh, as you can imagine, Apar was a bit more focused on 66A and I was uh, sort of more interested in other crimes as well. But, uh, and this was also a time when the Supreme Court had actually recently uh, decriminalized consensual uh, homosexual acts in Navte Johar. And it was also a time when adultery had been decriminalized. So it was, it was out there. So, I mean, it began as just like, you know, okay, let's, let's look at data. Apar had actually started looking at it himself over just, you know, one year period on what is publicly available in Indian Kanun. And that's one of the most amazing resources for lawyers that's out there and, and lay persons as well. So what we did was then we decided, okay, let's pick a methodology that's as ironclad as it can get between the two of us, because it was just the two of us doing it in our private time, as opposed to it being something that has any sort of funding or any sort of backing. So we got hold of whatever data sets we could by way of available uh, databases online. So that was a, a limiting, limitation factor for us. So we looked at SEC online, Manupatra, Indian Kanun, and whatever else we could find in the, uh, in the public domain. And it turned out that what was initially a hunch that this was going to happen ended up being a lot more than a hunch. And there were a lot of problematic aspects that we saw that did also relate to just law generally and what happens, let's say, when you know courts step into the fray and deal with striking down an offense as unconstitutional because there were prior incidents of this in the past as well. And all that's been discussed in the paper by us. And uh, yeah, so, so that's basically what led to the paper. And as you said at the start, then we got in touch with the good folks at PUCL who took up the matter. It went up to court. And I think Sanjana might have a lot more to say about that. But what I'll just sort of end on is, in a way, not much has changed. And that's why the launch of this tracker is such an important event, because what we had as far as the recommendation section of our own paper a lot of that actually didn't happen beyond the Supreme Court issuing what I, I frankly think was a slightly anodyne order. But uh, yeah, beyond that one order, not much has happened. And as the tracker will shamefully reveal, cases under 66A continue to be registered, even as of 2021, probably, as the months go by. So yeah, that, that's, that's that. So I would have to follow up on something you said. You mentioned how you were actually also very interested in other criminal provisions which were being used along with Section 66A. And that's, again, something we saw in Mr. Tyagi's case as well, right, where he was not only charged with Section 66A, but also with sedition, which itself is, again, a very vague and overbroad offense. So I was just wondering, what do you think about this tendency of police officials to use Section 66A with other offenses uh, based on the data that you looked at? What were these other offenses that were commonly used? And in that sense, do you think the problem is much bigger than 66A? Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. So I have the paper open and we had... Uh... You know, we we got a section in our initial table about cognizable offenses other than the IT Act. Now, let me take a step back here and, you know, sort of go into why 66A was as popular as it was before it got struck down. So in Indian criminal law, you have a basic distinction between a cognizable versus a non-cognizable offense. Cognizable, cognizable offenses allow police to arrest people without warrants. So that automatically gives a lot more, you know, bite to any enforcement action. 66A was as popular as it was because it was a cognizable offense. 
and uh, one thing was uh, one thing that we were very clear on focusing on was exactly what you're stressing that while you know there might be an entire array of numbers next to 66a as far as offenses how many of these are cognizable because then you have a clear motivation to see okay 66a is the only cognizable one so maybe that's why it's being lumped into a complaint that would otherwise only have non cognizable ones but what we saw was actually it wasn't that way and 66a was often accompanied by other cognizable crimes as well so that clear motivation was lost as far as our research is concerned what then i mean we had was only anecdotal uh, thoughts and you know conversations that we had with other lawyers with practicing uh, journalists and other people as well where frankly if you look, if you pick up a document if you pick up a police fir often a lot of it is you know there are similarities in narrative let's just leave it at that and anecdotally i started wondering whether that's what's happening that you know by let's say 2014 2015 you have a narrative that's there as far as a lot of cases are concerned and anything to do with online activity 66a sort of got slapped on so anything to do with the internet and this we saw even in our cases it might not really be you know something that is a 66a is vague yes but usually it's about online communication something that might be said or spoken of online sometimes that wasn't really involved like it was sharing images it was uh, dms and you know stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily think it tracked 66a and in fact it you it would also be you know 66a right with another section of the it act that has now again been a phenomenon that has been documented the replacement of 66a with other offenses so sort of coming back to the question and to answer it simply we didn't see a clear motivating factor for why 66a it seemed as if 66a was the go to criminal offense whenever something some narrative had any online aspect to it so yeah and i wonder you know maybe that's why it continues to get as much traction as it does because it's simp- it's you know it's it's, it's knee jerk for lack of a better phrase thanks abhinav one last question for you so in your paper you talk about this concept of signal failure and i had never really heard about this concept of signal failure before i read the paper and i was just wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about where you came up with that idea and why do you think it's possibly responsible for again continued use of section 66a sure thank you for that uh, actually signal failures is something that's not common for us as lawyers but it's very common if you look at uh, literature on administration bureaucracies and you know actually management stuff so if you if you speak to someone in the management circles they might be much more familiar with stuff like this because uh, it's it's much more common in those concepts and now what was its relevance in india is because well we are a very statist setup right so there's a very there is big government and there's big state so when when the state machinery moves a lot of you know a lot of those cogs have to sort of fall in line together so a message that starts from the top really has to pass through a lot of nodes to finally reach enforcement level and that's where signal failures happen right so for instance if let's say someone is beaming the signal at one end and it's just not reaching the ground then there's no point of that and we it sort of clicked in this context because it's happening at the topmost level of the judiciary with the supreme court but then for that message to travel all the way to the ground all the way to police stations in not only cities but also rural parts of the country which is where we saw some fir's come up it requires a lot of synergy between various not only between the judiciary itself which is not there so while it's not there in the judiciary what this kind of an enforcement action needs is synergy across branches of government so you need executive officers to take charge to spread the message amongst police forces to get it clear that you know this is not an offense and also you would hope that the legislature deletes the offense right because if you can't see it in a book you won't really go for it but what happened after 66a is that the supreme court passes this judgment the legislature does not follow it up either by way of challenging it 
when it did not challenge it, what you had was the legislature could have amended the IT Act. That didn't happen. So till date, you will find 66A is still there in a statute. What's there next to it is an asterisk that says it got declared unconstitutional. And at the level of the executive, you would have needed an outreach program that is sort of educating everyone in the system that look, this is no longer a law, let alone a crime, and you can't use it. But again, we didn't find any clear evidence of it at the stage of our paper. And Sanjana is probably going to talk about the orders that the Supreme Court passed that helped with that element. But again, spreading the message is one thing, consistently following it up is another. So in, in a big state like ours, especially for messages to travel from the topmost tier of an administration to the lowest rungs of it, there has to be a lot of coordination and the chances for signal failures are multifold, are manifold rather. So that, that, that's, the, that's broadly what we had in mind. And from whatever I am seeing and I continue to work with this problem, I don't think we're any close to trying to remedy these signal failures that had been identified much, much before this. Thanks, Abhinav. And just based on what you said, right, I think in that sense, Section 66A and what has happened with it also sheds light on a much more systemic problem, which probably exists in other categories of cases as well and requires a much more institutional fix. On Can I just note, give one example? Sorry, yeah, I'm sure. just going to overreach. But one example that was there in the paper and actually much more sinister than 66A in some senses was the earlier example of a crime being struck down was section 303 of the Indian Penal Code that dealt with death penalty for convicts. So people who were in jail and who had commit, who were convicts at the time and commit murder, it was automatic death. That got declared unconstitutional way back in 1982. We came across a case where a person was still on trial and the appeal was being considered as late as 2012. And I mean, just imagine being on death row for so many years in, a, in an offense that had mandatory death, pun, like the mandatory death penalty. So yeah, you're right. The signal failures as a problem really goes beyond just 66A. And I fear that, you know, with the Supreme Court having done this more, which is a great thing, I wonder the enforcement issues and, you know, only time will tell whether we're making any progress on that front. Sorry, that, that's it for me. <laughs> no, thanks, Abhinav. I mean, we may think of signal failure as an administrative or logistical issue, but as your example clearly demonstrates, it can be a life or death matter quite literally in some cases. Um, now, just coming to Sanjana. Sanjana is a lawyer who was involved in the second round of litigation before the Supreme Court seeking enforcement of the Shreya Singhal judgment. So starting off, Sanjana, if you could just tell us a little bit about how you got involved with this case. So our audience has a little bit of background. Yeah, so, um, I mean, much like, like Abhinav's experience, like a lot of, before the paper was published, um, so I was working with Sanjay Parekh, who's a senior advocate who argued the original case as well on behalf of PUCL. And um, so we had preliminary conversations with a par at the time at which the paper was being written. And um, when the paper finally came out, uh, I don't think I was prepared for what the findings would finally show, right? So, I mean, my personal like association with, at the time at which Shreya Singhal came out, I was still in law school and even not being a very sincere law student, I had read it cover to cover nonetheless, right? I mean, for us as a generation that's predominantly online, it was, it felt really significant and it was something that I think we overestimate how invested other people are in our work, but I kind of assume that everyone, irrespective of whether they were lawyers or not, was aware of the judgment because it felt like such a watershed moment. Uh, but when the paper came out and we realized the extent to which it's not being followed, um, I don't think we were prepared for that. I would say here, for instance, that PUCL has seen non-compliance in other cases as well. So the, when the final paper was brought to us and we were trying to consider what to do. Uh, so one example where we've seen a lot of non-compliance is at the time we were working on encounter killings in Uttar Pradesh and the guidelines in PUCL versus state of Maharashtra, which is only a few years old, were very clearly not being followed. Those kind of things we'd expected, like in a lot of cases, we continue to go back to court to uh, seek implementation. Uh, 
but i feel like there's a distinction between like 66a and those cases and in broadly and this is a very like arbitrary definition but broadly that's a question of whether it's a positive obligation based understanding of the right or a negative obligation based understanding so um positive obligations very rudimentary would be something which requires the state to take active steps to ensure that rights are protected and negative obligations just requires the state to not do the infringing act so you know when we've seen it in cases of socio economic rights when we've seen it in cases where there's guidelines of the judgment which are not being followed those were things that we still kind of expected to be progressively realized those were things that we thought that a judgment comes and then you litigate it over years and then there's some civil society involvement in it and over 10 years you see a difference but we were not prepared to see it in cases like 66a because the understanding of the law is that if a judge if a section is considered unconstitutional it it's as if it never existed it's a legal fiction that it never existed in the first place and i think that we did not think that like the act of just the state refraining from infringing your rights would be such a complicated process as abhina rightly said it has implications for a lot of other sections but i think that what we don't realize that the idea of a section being completely struck down is very rare right like we only i mean we've seen it a lot in the last decade with uh, adultery with 377 with 66a but if you look at the supreme court over the years it's been fairly rare for it to strike down like a judgment strike down a section in its entirety so i mean another interesting example is sedition as you mentioned right so in sedition what the supreme court has done is that it has read down the provision and even as lawyers we don't expect police officers to have a nuanced understanding for what that reading down means like whether something does affect public order or whether it is just criticism of the court even i mean overestimating the power of the court etc like even in my most positive reading of the impact of judgments i wouldn't expect like a police officer to draw that distinction right that's not even the role that is possibly envisaged for them but i think what we had not realized is that you know even if a section is struck down in its entirety and then there's no room for doubt about whether this is covered by the section or not there's no room for any kind of discretion for the executive i think in those situations we didn't expect to see this kind of continued prosecution thanks anjana especially for explaining that difference between like you know positive and negative obligations especially because when you went to the court the second time around you actually sought some positive action from the state um but before we get to that i just wanted to know what was the judges reaction when they found out that their judgment was so blatantly being violated so if you could give us like you know behind the scenes uh, kind of look into what went on in the courtroom i think it was fairly dramatically reported also so it's not so behind the courtroom so if you see the order it's just like issued notice so you know if you have like a legal history of what happened it doesn't feel that dramatic but it was uh i mean justice nariman was hearing the matter and uh, because he also wrote the original judgment and uh, to a lot of us as young litigators to be uh, you know in the path of justice nariman's ire is anyway not a very pleasant idea so i mean he did come down very heavily on uh, government counsels who were present present even on the first date of hearing before notice was issued etc and it was um, really widely reported i believe he even at one point said i'll start contempt proceedings against officers etc so uh, like he came down fairly heavily on them uh, during the first date of hearing uh, the only thing is that i mean and if i may say so i feel like that enthusiasm didn't last through the proceeding and which maybe when we speak about what the final order says a little bit uh, like i think to a large extent what we did is we replaced one court order which was not being complied with with another court order which clearly is still not being complied with coming to that sanjana like how did you so when you were going about say the process of drafting that application right how did you guys decide what was the exact relief you wanted to seek what were the directions that you wanted from court so was that a process of like debate discussion yeah what was the thinking behind that 
yeah i think to a large extent like i mean a lot of that inspiration did come from the paper like i do think that abhinav and aparth had put a lot of thought into the kind of recommendations that they had etc but um i think what when we started the process what we were more interested in is how have courts dealt with this problem before and whether courts have been aware of the fact that people i mean honestly obviously common people don't uh, read court judgments right and so it was like for us it was first investigating whether the judiciary has the humility to consider that you know their judgments don't have direct impact so um things that we found were um interesting uh was one in dk basu which sets out guidelines uh for uh, arrest custodial torture etc uh in dk basu there was a direction uh which required that police is made aware of these guidelines by dissemination to the director generals of police similarly in um voluntary health association which deals with non implementation of laws surrounding sex selective abortion uh so they required because i think one of the issues they were considering was that like trials were not moving in the manner in which they would so they required dissemination to registries of the high court which we thought was quite interesting where like the court is the supreme court is realizing that high courts are not aware of their judgment and the high courts were supposed to further uh, disseminate to district courts so these i mean seem like a good point to start right where you have um dissemination to members of the judiciary and to members of the executive and the police directly uh what was more interesting i think is uh, the justice nariman himself in uh, in the navtej judgment did require i mean not so specifically not in terms of to police etc but did require in his separate opinion that the judgment be given wide publicity right so you do see some amount of recognition of the fact that judicial decisions do not have immediate impact and you see that the judiciary is somewhat willing to engage with that question uh what was more interesting for us though is that um uh before uh, the decriminalization of suicide by the supreme court uh there was a order of the delhi high court by justice sachar who uh, was the first person to quash it in an individual case and this is not a reported um order but subsequently in exercise of supervisory jurisdiction he collected data on the pending cases across district courts in delhi and i feel like that kind of proactive monitoring we haven't really seen elsewhere so one of the directions that we were also interested in which finally did not happen is to require the union to collect data across states on the number of cases which are pending and we were hoping that once that data is brought to the supreme court uh then maybe there would be some kind of directions where i mean we hadn't that i mean we're still observing the course of proceedings but once that data came to the court we just asked for appropriate directions but one possibility was something like this right where the supreme court directs high courts to monitor district courts based on its inherent supervisory jurisdiction because um what is actually quite surprising from the paper is that even courts are not aware of the judgment right it's not just that non lawyers don't know that 66a has been struck down even um courts have not really taken note of that in fact um the delhi high court in uh, one of the applications i think that iff had filed for clarification also in an unrelated case where someone was seeking um online censorship like people filing public interest litigation to reduce rights is becoming increasingly common but like the response of the delhi high court was that we don't need censorship which is great but they said that we already have 66a which is in 2019 like four years after the judgment has been you know has come out it's like a high court decision which has failed to take note of shia singh thanks anjana so based on what you are saying i'm hearing that there are a couple of different approaches the first is of course awareness building 
which yeah. is when you ask uh, the court to pass directions for dissemination of copies of the judgment with like police stations, district court judges, etc. The other is, of course, data collection and greater transparency, so you can figure out what to do with pending cases. But as our experience shows that even after the second round of litigation, yeah. Section 66A is still being used. Yeah. So in this case, do you think maybe we should be looking at a third approach, maybe some kind of a punitive approach which leads to deterrence? And what would be your thoughts on that? Like when I say punitive approaches, I mean things like, you know, maybe fining government officials. I understand the political environment and the court being the way it is um, are things that we cannot control. But do you think there's merit in exploring those options? Um, I honestly can't comment on this very authoritatively. I uh, personally have never been a fan of punitive approaches and I think that their uh, reach is quite limited. But uh, I think this is something that Abhinav has written about in the past, right? About like uh, making the burden of violations a bit higher for uh, executive authorities. Like maybe there is some merit to that. But I think other than that, what needs to be done and uh, you know, this goes back to my original point of assuming that the judgment has a very wide reach. I think lawyers as a community are very insulated. Like we go to these five-year law schools and we, uh, you know, interact a lot with other lawyers. Uh, I think that there are, I think that it's time for us to also have the humility to recognize that there are approaches beyond courts to enforce rights. And it's something that, as I said, in the case of positive obligations, like you would see uh, you would see that really actively. You would see, uh, for instance, in cases involving like a rehabilitation from, uh, say, the Narmada Dam, etc. You, you see, like, like you see decades of like community building which people have invested in without any involvement from lawyers. I feel like what we need to do is recognize that we have an increasingly democratized online community. I mean, not completely. Obviously, access is inequitable. But increasingly, we see that the people who are coming online are not people that we, within our social spheres, in, interact with or, you know, spend a lot of time with. It's not based in Delhi now. It's not based in certain strata of society with access to English, etc. Uh, I think what we really need to do is think collaboratively and think beyond legal reforms in the courts as a site of reform for advancement of rights. I think one example is, uh, I mean, the kind of community building that perhaps IFF is attempting to do, where you just start mobilizing people who are using the internet as stakeholders in conversations that impact them. That is one thing. And I mean, because even for people to, even for people to seek to enforce their rights, they have to have the knowledge that their rights are being violated. That is one. The other is, for instance, even the Civic Data Lab is perhaps one example of this, right? Where we're collaborating with people with domain knowledge that is not strictly legal, where we're collaborating with other actors in the field. So, I mean, I think that my response to the question would be that, honestly, that I don't know what the solution is, but I increasingly anticipate that the solutions will not come from lawyers or from people who engage with the law. Like what had to be done in court is done, you know, and we have to think of solutions beyond court for this. Thanks for that, Sanjana, because it also provides me the perfect segue to now move on to the man of the hour, Apoor, who's actually built this website and is a technologist and a non-lawyer to talk to us a little bit about this. So Apoor, I was really not involved in building of the website and I saw it for the first time today. Like I went through it for the first time today and it looks fantastic. Uh, so I just want to want you to tell us a little bit about what it was like building this and what is the underlying technology that is powering this website? Because I know that e-district court websites are notoriously difficult to like use. So how did you manage to get so much like, you know, very detailed data from there? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, so there's, there definitely has been like a team who, uh, you know, who is involved in building this. I am just the presenter here. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, so I think uh, before uh, maybe August, August of 2019 is when none of us knew about, uh, you know, this problem 66A, but like we were in regular, uh, in regular conversations with Apar and other members 
from IFF because of our mutual involvements in open data groups and stuff like that. So that is when we uh, came to know about this problem. Now to us, or I'm talking about myself here, to me it looked like, okay, you know, you know, this is like you're just tracking a rule in a way. So it should not be like, it should be very straightforward to track. And uh, yes, you will. We were aware about e quotes. We were aware about the kind of data it has and what it takes to get data from there. But still, it looked like, okay, now the, we can probably, you know, do like a small project or a pilot just to see, okay, what we are getting. So that is how it all started. So we did like a very small pilot for Maharashtra in 2019 itself. Again, you know, just out of interest as Abhinav had also started his work without any funding or anything, just to see, okay, what are we getting? Is this data even present on eCoach? Because with eCoach, the digitization process is still going on. Uh, it is very different across the states. Uh, so it's not like, you know, you will have every case there. And especially we are looking here uh, from 2009 till 2020. So we were not sure because um, a lot of, uh, uh, I think NIPFP recently came up with a paper and they said that uh, uh, a lot of data is there post 2012 and 2013. But before that, you don't have any uh, good uh, case cases there good number of cases there. So yeah, we tried a pilot. The results were not very convincing, but the signal we got there that yes, there are some 66 cases present beyond 2015 as well, which is what we were interested in. So uh, yeah, so then we, uh, as yeah, um, as Abhinav said, you know, Apar uh, and other members from IFF, they like all of us were really kind of excited to continue our work with this, but we also realized that it will take some dedicated time and effort you know, to build this out. So we started applying for grants. Uh, fortunately, uh, tech for dev was one of the organizations. Uh, they came out with a grant. We applied for it. We did a few rounds, uh, like uh, both Apar and uh, other members from his team were involved in the interviews and we finally got the grant. It was a six month grant, but then I think, uh, when we got this news that, you know, we can go ahead with the project. It was sometime in, uh, January or February of 2020. And then, uh, so we were building the, uh, building out the statement of work and, you know, making our project plans. And then we had the lockdown. So I think in March is, or if I remember correctly, March is when we were, uh, uh, in IFF's office discussing about, okay, this is what we need to do because firstly, we didn't understand a lot about, you know, the legal side of things. So, uh, we were just dependent on IFF for that. Uh, and uh, then yeah, uh, but yeah, lockdown happened. So, uh, see, fortunately, the plans didn't change. Uh, we just thought that okay, let's see. So initially, we started with seven states. Uh, so we kicked off the project in April. We started with seven states, and uh, you know, because again, we were not sure of what will what will it take because we uh, uh, we it will not be possible to you know meet physically, and all of it will happen over calls. IFF was not very sure about how to work with data. We were not very sure about the legal side of things. So it was all very experimental. So we started with seven states. I think in, in a couple of months, we had the data. Now, I think the biggest challenge with doing any project, not just this, like any project that is on top of e quotes is the lack of, uh, you know, uh, data standards. Uh, first of all, lack of data. Second is lack of data standards. So even if you have that, so there were so many things that we wanted to do because you know, so we are just, if you see the website now, we are just reporting some very, now this is again, very important because you don't even have this data anywhere, but still, you know, there's a lot of, lot of other things that you can do. If you have daily orders, judgments, sentencing, uh, uh, orders on sentences and, you know, other things, nothing is there. Uh, maybe in, in a state or do they are pre present, but if you, uh, you know, if you see a picture across India, you don't have a lot of data on equals. Uh, so that, that is one problem. Uh, but still, so, uh, again, now other issue we faced was how, how, how you should identify a 66 a case on equals. So the usual process is you, when you search for a case on equals, you first, uh, you know, search for an act and then you search for a section and then you get, okay, these are the cases. The act is standardized. So for example, there are fixed number of acts. So you can search for information technology act, but the section is just the, you know, free text field. So you, uh, you, anyone can write anything there. 
you know so uh, so that was one reason we couldn't search for a 66a case because the way this data is entered is uh, again you know suppose you are entering the data you will write 66a someone will write 60 in you know words someone will write it in hindi and other languages so this is a problem so what we did was and i think that is the only solution uh, you try you just fetch everything that is available under the information technology act now for the if i remember correctly for the seven states initial seven states we have to uh, you know get data for around 60000 cases uh, out of which we have to then uh, through some automation and through some manual processes fetch out okay what exactly 66a and then we came up with this these 2000 cases so it's less than 5% all the other data is like i don't think how it will be used now so i think these are some of the challenges that kind of and again you know you it's it it was a very small project six month project and we spent i think close to 3 to 4 months in just getting this data in the first place uh our idea was to get the data in the first month and you know concentrate on the research and the platform building side of things but yeah, yeah that is where we are so yeah i think these are some of the challenges we faced uh, uh, sorry one one last challenge so when we completed our exercise for seven states i think uh, we we got less than 1000 cases and again you know at that time we were not even sure whether whether we are doing things correctly whether you know we, these are the correct cases or are we missing on a lot of cases and so on so we decided to include more states uh, because i think at that by that time we got an idea of okay what time a state will take you know so i think by the end we had 11 states we were kind of fine with 2000 cases though there are a lot more cases and even in this 11 states i'm sure we have missed a lot of cases so you know whatever we are seeing this is not this is the minimum i, I will say you have more cases and uh, yeah so it's again yeah, a lot of manual effort is required to find the cases in the first place that's very interesting because i always imagine that you know this would be an entirely automated process yeah. so yeah it's a uh, good it's i mean i don't i wouldn't want to say it's good to know because it's actually quite terrible to know that a lot of manual effort also went into just identifying these cases uh, but apur i was just wondering if you faced maybe similar problems with other projects you've done maybe in like non legal context is this a common problem with data driven projects in india in general like this kind of lack of standardization and other issues uh yeah public data is difficult to handle i think one reason is it's uh, you know so everything has started to get digitized so if you are looking for something and you know just from a historical perspective if something is going beyond 2015 and 2014 the data quality starts going down and you will not even have a lot of things so earlier we used to face problem like even with judgments you know like if you do want to do some uh, so it's a uh, sorry i'm using a technical term here natural language processing which means to extract something out of a you know big text so that you can create data in the first place you will need data or you will need documents that are that can be read by a machine like a machine readable document you know it should not be scanned uh, like you cannot click a photo and then upload it it you know so there are these difficulties there are these challenges which makes this whole uh, process very difficult a good thing that is happening um, and uh, especially on the le uh, legal re um, in the uh, law and justice sector in india and what we are also trying is kind of creating like a uh, portal just for good open public data sets like for example now we have uh, data for 11 states we kind of store it in a way on that portal so that you know it can be maintained not by us by others as well and they can keep adding to it so you know so first of all definitely the authorities who are responsible for maintaining the these platform public platforms they they are they are doing what they can but it will take some more time so i think we only have to preserve it in the best way we can uh, and other challenges there is always a lack of documentation uh, with with any like across sectors that is health education you know it's always lacking and it takes a lot of time to you know first just understand what is this and then work on it especially for people like us who are you know not part of that sector and you know understand everything there thank you so much apur i think that gave us a lot of insight into uh, what went into building this website um i think that's it from me thank you so much to everybody for joining us today 